three, two, one. It is a pleasure to meet you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for hosting me and having me down here to do this. Well, welcome to or Santa I, Fe. Or I guess up here. Yeah. yeah Wolf and Roadrunner in the <laughs> dining room. I didn't think I'd ever have a podcast in the dining room, but this, here, is, a, this, here is, a we are. this is a gorgeous setup. Yeah. You know what? This is like quintessential Santa Fe right here. It's really beautiful. I mean, I'm glad you guys are here to enjoy it and well, welcome. Thank you very much. Um, I, I found out about you because uh, like we were talking about a little bit earlier. A bunch of my friends were sharing this, uh, like the giveaway you were oh, doing yes. for the chef's table. Yes, yes. And I saw that and I was like, I know nothing about food <laughs> other than I needed to survive. <laughs> yeah. And uh, but that guy clearly loves what he does. Darn so, right so, about so that. like that's the kind of guy I want to talk to. I appreciate that. Um, and we were talking beforehand. You just got a pretty good deal mm. uh, with like an exclusive meat or like exclusive cattle. Can you explain that a little well, bit? Well, you know, uh, with our brand here, you know, we're growing. We're, we're we're definitely kind of you know some new kids on the block here in Santa Fe, and and opening Wolf and Roadrunner and this in this concept, you know, kind of revolved around an open fire kitchen. So we cook over oak and pecan woods and. And one of the cool things that we're, we're really working towards right now is we're going to work with an exclusive purveyor that's going to get us our beef, you know, because we really find, you know, great pride in, in, in purveying the right product for the people. So this beef is going to be superior. You know, it's going to be an amazing product that we're going to carcass age 30 days. It's going to really, I think, enhance our brand and make us super unique. And in Santa Fe, I think that's necessary with a lot yeah. of competition and a lot of places that you can go to. And, uh, you know, with my passion and with my team's hard work, I think that, you know, we're going to not only push the beef side of, of, of what we're doing here, but everything that we're doing here in recipes and in developing our kind of style of restaurant. And, uh, you know, this is, like you said, you know, I really do enjoy what I do. I have a good time doing it as hard as it can be some days. You know, I, I always wanted to be here in Santa Fe as, as a restaurateur, as, even as a chef, you know, as a young kid. It's, it's you know, it's been a dream of mine. And, and here we are, you know, I'm able to, you know, now kind of navigate through this business and, and add these really cool, unique portions that are going to hope, hopefully make us stand out and, and make people make a stop over here and try what we're doing. Because, uh, again, we're in a beautiful location. And uh, I think now we just got to start adding the really nice pieces to our brand and, and really get ourselves to be one of the game players here in Santa Fe. Is, so is the bar on the other side of yours as well? Well, you know what? It's a cool situation that we have here. We kind of collaborate with them. So we work okay. in conjunction with them. Nice. So Secreto here, here in Santa Fe is just one of those unique bars that has, okay. you know, um, kind of this wildness to it. And it kind of really is interesting how we've kind of, harmoniously connected you know the way they do their drinks and they're smoking sage for a margarita and we're back there smoking sage for our <laughs> juniper sauce and you know we're kind of having these cool natural uh, uh kind of connections and and that's been a fun thing for us to kind of learn and see kind of happen naturally and uh, so yeah secreto and wolf and roadrunner we work together we run together um they provide the drink and the wine experience in here and and uh, yeah, we're developing a new drink and wine list and, and kind of, you know, heightening everything around here. So, but the Hotel St. Francis is just a prestigious place to be. And, and it's one of those places that uh, if you come to Santa Fe, you want to make a pit stop here to have a cocktail and, and now have dinner here. Yeah, no, that's yeah. awesome. And I, I guess I should have had you introduce yourself in the beginning because you're, so you're the head chef as well as the yeah, owner. Yeah. Uh, how long have you been here for? Well, okay, so at this, at this location, we've only been open for two months now. Okay. Um, beyond that, you know, I, I was a corporate chef for a, a company called Heritage Hotels. Heritage Hotels actually owns this hotel and uh, amongst others, in its spot, Loretto, the El Dorado Hotel, Hotel Chimayo, and if you're in Albuquerque, Hotel Albuquerque, Hotel oh, wow, Chaco, okay. Sawmill Market. So they're just a huge player, you know, and I've been with them for 15 years. I've uh, kind of started with them and and saw the vision of the owner, Jim Long, and, and the president, Adrian Perez, and, and really how they, they believed in, in New Mexico and New Mexican culture and, and, and wanted to build a luxury hotel brand in, in New Mexico. And, and, you know, I've seen that progression and that rise, and I've been fortunate enough to take that ride with them. You know, they've been extreme mentors to me, and they've, you know, opened up tons of doors for me and, and allowed me to, you know, you know, do what I love. So... Again, you know, being here at this hotel is kind of, again, a full circle moment, you know, and being back with Heritage is, is another full circle moment for me as well. Um, and prior to this, we had a business at Sawmill Market. Oh, okay. Uh, we did roti, and uh, we were all about chicken. chicken. Okay, okay, Rotisserie cool. Chicken. Oh, just for chicken, okay. 
And cool. man, do I miss that chicken. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, we, we, we put a lot of effort into everything we do. You know, that was a fast, casual concept and, and something I hope to bring back. We're going to revive it and maybe here in Santa Fe at some point here. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by the amazing people over at Chop Chili Company. Guys, they are the original sponsor of this podcast, and I could not be happier to continue to be working with these guys. I get it. It's New Mexico. Everyone loves red, green, both. But this genuinely is my favorite brand of chili here in the state of New Mexico, and I love being able to partner up with these guys. They are absolutely phenomenal. Zane and the rest of the team at Chop Chili do an amazing job running that company, and they make an absolutely phenomenal product and right now they are running a very special promotional on their instagram go check them out on instagram go give them a follow and as they post pictures with the hashtag where's my chili challenge if you can guess where in new mexico that picture was taken you can win not only free red or green chili but also a free custom t-shirt directly from the company themselves. Again, go check them out on Instagram. Give them a follow. Check out their hashtag, Where's My Chili Challenge. Win yourself some free chili. Win yourself some free shirts. They are also available in Smith's, Albertson's, Sprouts, and a ton of other uh, grocery stores in the state of New Mexico as well as El Paso and they are expanding out to West Texas. Again, thank you so much to Zane and the rest of his amazing team over at Chop Chili. Back to the episode. In the near future, but uh, you know, it was such a cool experience to open that, that small business, that fast casual business and kind of start opening my 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 entrepreneurship and, and really what I kind of wanted to be, a food businessman, somebody that can conceptualize and build a, a product and a brand that is, is sustainable. And, and uh, yeah, and that's kind of where we're at here. And we're jumping around. No, yeah, no you're yeah. good. No, you're great. That's, that's what's great about podcasting is you can just sit back and yeah. talk. Yeah, yeah. You know, there's no like, because that's one of the reasons why I started doing it is because uh, I've, like senior year of high school into college, I started getting more into politics and yeah. really watching like, I started like watching debates and just seeing the insanity that is before, before we even got <laughs> we to this, got last to this one. crazy point. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And I just, what I really, what I really hated about it was they were, they would ask these people that want to be president. They'd be like, Hey, fix climate change in 60 seconds. Yeah. Like, what? Wow. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's, there's people in that audience don't even know what climate change is. They don't even know what the issue of abortion is, what gun, gun laws, da, da, da. So I think it's just insane asking somebody to answer a question of that magnitude in 60 seconds, let alone like, Hey, why do you like your job in yeah. 60 seconds? You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So that's, that's, what's amazing about this type of platform. I'm very thank obviously very thankful that stuff like this has exploded. Um, and talking about something exploding, like, the people you worked with that you just named and all, all the businesses that they run and operate in Albuquerque or in New Mexico, mm -hmm. those are some pretty solid people to not like ride the coattails off of, but like to get your launching pad from, sure, sure. you know what I mean? Cause like you walk into a place like Sawmill, it's hard to believe it's in Albuquerque sure. for better or worse. You know what I mean? Like just to be completely honest. Yeah. You know I mean, it, it looks something out of Colorado, sure. Tempe, Southern California, like something's like, Oh, we actually have something nice here. Yeah. It's ambitious. Don't break it. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's so <laughs> ambitious. And I think that's what really drew me to them. I was yeah. like, you know, I had opportunities to leave and go work in a lot of different places, but home is home, right? And yeah. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by the amazing people over at High Desert Relief, a premier herbal destination right here in the state of New Mexico. They have extremely well-trained and knowledgeable staff that are more than happy to help you find what you're looking for or try something that you maybe have never thought of before. They have two locations right here in Albuquerque and a third in Santa Fe. All three will be listed in the description of this episode below. All three locations offering legendary products at absolutely legendary prices, including this awesome merch that they were so kind enough to give me. Um, they can be found at all three of the locations. Again, big thank you to all the people over at HDR. Back to the episode. 
a native New Mexican, I always wanted to do the, you know, the best that I could do here in my own community rather than take it elsewhere and, yeah. and, 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 you know, gain that experience and come back at some point, you know, if you do. Uh, but, but, you know, New Mexico and New Mexico culture has always meant that to me and, and seeing how they did it and how they, you know, were bold and they were ambitious and they built something that shouldn't really <laughs> be there in an in a, in a old <laughs> sawmill market building, you know, and, and now it's this beautiful piece of, you know, real estate there that, is um, kind of an incubator for small businesses and people mm-hmm. are, you know, building cool concepts and growing different concepts. And, and I think that's amazing, you know, so he's, he's, he's opening doors and, and growing that, that, that side for, for a lot of different people. And, and that's, that's, that's the cool thing about it, you know, and then, you know, for us to have a business there and to kind of get our foot in the, in the water and to see, you know, after COVID and, and that experience, you know, it was important for me to do something bold and big and, and to, you know, cause I've been doing this since I was 14 years old. I've been in the kitchens and, you know, from my grandparents teaching me to learning from my uncle Steve and uh, who was a, an accomplished chef in his own right. And, and uh, you know, just being in kitchens as a young kid, you know, this is everything to me. So, you know, I, I never wanted to lose that passion for it. Right. I always wanted to keep it going. And, you know, after the pandemic, some of that luster was lost in, in our industry and, and, uh, you know, I always felt it was important for me to just keep pushing it forward, keep doing the right thing, teach these guys, you know, get them excited again into, into food. And, and really, that's kind of where we're at. You know, Roti was a, a stepping, stone, stepping stone up to this point, And now we're, we're just, you know, doing the right thing back there, working hard, doing, you know, the right work to our food, purveying the right product, you know, working on our recipes to be perfect, you know, and, and, and teaching the young guys and the young women and the young adults out there that want to learn and want to, you know, see really what it is to be a chef and what it right. does it mean to do this type of work. And it's hard, yes, but it's extremely rewarding in a lot of different ways. I think mentally as a chef, you're challenged and you're, and you're kind of adapting to a lot of different situations. And, and it helps me even outside of work, you know, to be a better human, to be a better person for the, for, for, for our world, you know, and, you know, I, I take it that seriously. I do. Yeah. I enjoy it. And, and I, and I tried to pass this knowledge on and, and, uh, you know, now I'm, I'm going to be 40 years old and I'm ready to just keep teaching the younger generation what it means to be a hard worker and to have commitment and to be disciplined in a craft and to, you know, learn and to, and to enjoy it too, you know? So, you know, that's, that's important too. Hard work can be enjoyed, you know, hard oh, work, yeah. hard work can make you feel good. You well, know? avoiding hard work's not a good thing. No. And it's, it's obvious with the way you speak about, about what you do. And you, some of you say, you just said about how the hard work you put into this and how, well, how proficient you've gotten here has made you a better human in yeah. every part of your life. I mean, that's by, I think, I really do believe that's mm. in us biologically, especially as men, mm-hmm. right? We we are hard tuned to work, achieve, and build something, mm-hmm. something to something. provide, yeah. right? Whatever that is, like we're not people in caves anymore, bonking a woolly mammoth and then dragging it in, <laughs> yeah. and you know what I mean? Like there is something, especially with how I mean, there's a lot of horrible things going on with how comfortable life has become for people. It's like okay, we still have that inside us, so to go out and create and conquer and build something and provide something, whether it's to our community, to our family whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Um, and touching on that, you've been in restaurants for four, since you were 14. My first job, well, for the first seven years of working, I was a busser and a server. Okay. Can you speak a- about the importance of working in the service injury, in the service industry as a teenager going into adulthood? It's huge, man. I, I think the most important thing it's going to take, teach you is is a it's going to be disciplined because you're going to have to be structured and there's a structured environment and again as a young adult you want a little bit of discipline being taught to you the other part of it is this hospitality how to have a smile on your face even if you're having a bad day (laughs) even if your car just broke down but you still make it to work on time and you're still going to have a good service and so you know, I have, that's kind of what it really taught me was to, you know, understand how to, you know, discipline yourself and, and, and be your best self, even in tough times, you know, cause, uh, nobody in the dining room really cares that you're having an issue outside of here yeah. and you have to perform. And that's important. I think in life you, you really have to, you know, find those ways to dig deep and do your best work, even when times aren't the best, you know, because that's life, you know, and sometimes it's going to be tough and it's going to be a little difficult, but those that get through it and still produce at a high level, I think are the ones that become successful and actually enjoy their life more because they're not looking at it as these, these tough, 
hard things that are just happening to me and, and kind of, you know, allowing that to ruin their day. So, you know, I think the hospitality industry really teaches you that because you have to have a smile on your face if you're a host. You have to have a smile on your face if you're serving or even if you're busting the table. You know what? You have to cook with love and care because your food really won't taste the same if you're just slopping it in there and forgetting the season and forgetting that, you know what? I want that skin to be perfect. You know, that takes actual internal love because you have to enjoy that part of that job, you right. know, and, and that's, that's something that the hospitality industry teaches a lot of youngsters out there and a lot of young adults that, you know, you have to care about what you do. And, and this industry alone is, is so high strung and it's so, you know, there's some negative connotations around it and, and it is a tough, you know, industry to be a part of, but you know, there's some really deep learning that you can get out of it. And I, and I definitely have gotten it as, as a young adult and, and I've, had tough bosses, tough chefs, you know, yeah. guys that will punch you down and get you moving in the right direction. And if you understand how to take that um, and understand how to deal with somebody that's hard, I think that's necessary. And I think it's something we need in our new era and our new generation and, and helping them to get to that point to take hard work and, and, and hard knowledge and feedback in a positive way. Well, you, you mentioned something earlier about, you know, no one really cares about how you're feeling like in the dining room, right? Yeah. Your customers, and it's not their job to No. And in reality, it's not your employers either. Does that mean employees need to la and need to have like no empathy? Not at all. Right. And you should care about the people below you and sure. you should respect the people above you. Like that should be a sure. good working environment. But at the same time, nobody's asking you to do the job that you have mm -hmm. are, are, now granted i understand that a lot of people have jobs out of necessity mm -hmm. they may not love it and they may not have found the thing they love not able to do the thing they love and i get that but at the end of the day no one's really like putting a gun to your head and forcing you to be at that specific place mm -hmm. so it's like hey man you got to put your personal shit aside at least for the next eight hours <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah and i tell you man it's gotten more and more difficult but i do see a glimmer of hope you know i have a lot of young adults working with us right now and I'm really grateful for them because they show me that there's people or young adults that still want this you know and you know I have a couple of great examples that I, I you know I look at them and I admire them because they're they're putting in that effort and I'm right. watching it in real time like okay Gil, you know, yeah these guys really are trying then it makes me be my best you know so again it all is about it's it's a whole circle thing you know as a, as a, as a leader a boss an owner you know, I have to provide the environment so that they actually enjoy it, right? Yeah. We have to provide the tools. We have to make things functional. We have to have the right setups for them. And, you know, as, I, as I've grown in this industry, I think that's the one thing that, you know, we have to be better as, as better leaders, better bosses, better mentors, and really, you know, give these guys the tools so that they can see that it can be done. You know, I like that they watch me as a young adult doing this and they're like, wow, the chef's doing this. You know, he's opening a restaurant. He's doing all these cool things. So it's inspiring them to say, hey, maybe I'll do that one day. And uh, in return, it gives me back the inspiration to say, be your best, Gil. Do your best for these guys. Show them the right ways. Make it better for them. Find the beef producer that's going to make us busier and keep us going so that we can, you know, be a sustainable business for the long term. Um, you know, just doing the right things, you know, and, and in, in this and in this industry, you know, there's there's no off days. You really have to put in effort. You know, it's 14 hour days every day just to make sure that everything is done perfectly. You know, yep. we want our guests to know how hard we work. We want them to taste that. We want them to experience that in our service. And yeah, we have a long, little long way to go, you know, but I think, you know, with training and with dedication and how we're doing it is it's it's starting to really come come together. And, and that's important to me. Well, and that's the responsibility you take on as the owner. Yes. You know what I mean? That's, yeah. that's the responsibility you take on. And the bigger the risk, the bigger reward, which yeah. is clearly something you're starting to really flourish in now. Um, you hear a lot about like food is a love language. Right. And you mentioned a little bit earlier about how during COVID kind of the luster and the kind of the almost like the pristineness of like food at a high level started to lose its way. I could totally be off about this, but I remember. And again, it happened out of necessity. I understand that. But when the lockdowns happened and people basically every restaurant, if you wanted to stay open, you had to like move to some sort of carry out. Yeah. You had to. Mm -hmm. What got lost in translation from like, aside from the obvious experience of, you know, sitting down in a restaurant with people you care about or people you care about a business meeting, whatever, mm -hmm. sitting down in person, having uh, interaction, having someone's wait, wait on you, serve, having someone in the back, making your food with care and love. 
but the actual like content of the food itself, what do you feel like got lost in translation from like, we're serving you this hot meal on a plate, then we're serving you this hot meal is going to go into a to-go container and it either gets walked to your car or gets delivered to your, mm. to your home. What got lost in that? I think everything was lost at that point. You know, it was, um, I mean, it was completely different than, you know, enjoying the service and coming in and knowing people are coming in for a celebratory experience or an occasion and, and you're now cooking for somebody that needs to eat and they're coming in their car and, and you know, anything in a box is never going to look as beautiful as something on a beautiful dish. And most importantly, I think, you know, when people were offered assistance to be at home and to you know, work from home or, you know, stay from home, you know, we lost a lot of those people to, you know, cause this is, again, it's a hard environment. And at that point they were saying, Hey, I'll make some money doing this outside of work. I don't really have to go to the restaurant and, and, and work a lot of hours. Now I can be at home. Um, so again, it kind of just sucked all those people out and I, th and I get it, you know, people were afraid and, and it was a scary time. And, and we were in a predicament where we were just working and, and trying to figure it out day by day. And, um, but once you got people away from the industry, um, it was hard to pull them back. Um, Cause it's a hot environment, it's a high stress environment. And when people were making good money being at home or you know, doing whatever, they start, they start to find other uh, ways to make the same kind of money. So for us, it was a difficult thing to kind of reboot and get people back into this and say, you know, oh, I love this industry again. And, and again, four years now has passed or almost four years has passed. And I see the people coming back and I feel that energy back. So what got lost in translation there was kind of a little bit of everything. It was a chaotic time for me to be a chef. You know, I remember being the chef and the only one on property, you know, cooking for people. That was it, you know, because again, we had to... Uh, bring down the payroll because we weren't doing the numbers and right. you know little by little all that kind of went away to where it was just one chef on property and, and you were cooking for a few people and and um you know even that right there is a mental kind of distraction and you know yeah. you know how, how how do you put out food that you love when you're kind of in this situation that is just kind of depressing in essence you know yeah. and so the hospitality industry i feel really got wrecked and um but I'm excited to see it coming back and I'm excited to see, you know, as, as it slowly come back. And um, I know I'm talking about it like it was last week, but it feels that way for me a little bit sometimes. Like it took this long to get to this point to see people wanting to come back and, and enjoy cooking and enjoy serving, enjoy dishwashing, you know, enjoy that. You know, you have to have those people in there that are actually wanting to do those positions and, and what you're describing too it's you know people when people were out of the were forced to be out of their workplace and reevaluate from it for a lot of people i mean you know just because the way that our nation's economy has been been going even before covid mm -hmm. like yes it was marginally better under president trump but there were still people a lot of people living paycheck by paycheck of course, yeah. not a lot of families taking vacations anymore that's been on a 20-year downturn entering the 2000s mm -hmm. And um, that was the first break these people had in years, if not ever. So now they're in their ho house like, I don't know if I love this anymore. And if they find another way to make income, that's a positive for them. In, the, in, in real time, it's a negative for you. But I would imagine, not 100% of the time, but I would imagine that as things started opening back up and employees started coming in, now you're getting people that actually want to be here. Sure. You know what I mean? And, that, and that's not to say that the people beforehand were lesser employees because they're not, but it's like, no, you're finding people that are more passionate, people that actually want to be there, or at a bare minimum, people just will completely hate it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, no, like, I don't hate this. This could be a great stepping stone for me, whether it's I need extra income or I do want to be in the restaurant industry in one mm -hmm. way or another. It's there's obviously a lot more negatives than positive about the lockdowns, but the few positives that were there should shouldn't be overlooked. Sure, you yeah. know what I People mean. People had a chance and, to evaluate themselves, and it's cool. Yeah. It, it's cool to see a lot of entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial like spirit come out of America mm -hmm. again. Yeah, and um, you know, I again, I'm not a numbers guy. I'm not a math guy. I'm terrible at it, and I'm just hoping that regardless of what happens in this next election that our economy starts to kind of do another upswing again because i mean stuff like eating out going to the movie theater i mean 
shit, buying groceries is becoming so yeah. expensive for a lot of people mm-hmm. where it's like, well, if I want to take my, if you ha- if you can afford to have a family, if you want to take your family or if you have a girlfriend, a wife, husband, boyfriend, whatever, if you want to take them on a date, it's like, do I have the money for it? Does this go on the credit card? And we worried about it later. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, and you were talking a little bit earlier about like, as this is becoming more established and you're getting more settled in your place, thinking about doing something like you were at Sawmill, is that outside of just having more exclusivity, that's, I'd imagine that's a huge challenge is finding the one, th- one or two things that makes this stand out mm-hmm. compared to other, you know, um, fine dining establishments with something like you used to do at Sawmill, is that something that I might be a more like, not necessarily like a more affordable option, but a more like family friendly option, a more like satellite type option? Like yeah. what's your concept yeah, for that? Yeah, well, you know, um, that was the idea behind, you know, that, that concept was really to, you know, for people to enjoy the flavors that I like to make as a, as a chef. And, you know, I get, you know, in a restaurant like this, there's a smaller percentage that will enjoy it a lot, you know, and I really wanted people to try our, my food, especially in that setting. And, and yeah, I do want to open up another fast casual concept, you know, that, you know, will be a better price point. And, and, um, but affordability is about, is, is in everything that I do, even in this setting here, you know, the prices are about, you know, the balance between your costs and your overhead and, 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 yeah. and your profit margin and how you're going to, you know, build profit to build the business to be sustainable. So, you know, I'm always looking for the best deal. I'm always looking for the ways to, you know, never pass it on to our customer, you know, but we, you know, want to provide the best experience. And so finding the best product in this setting is going to be, you know, that, that um, you know, higher end dining type experience. Yeah. Um, but there's a lot of ways that, you know, we, we take steps towards, you know, making things affordable and, you know, the roti concept is not lost. You know, I, I definitely want to bring that back in, in a really fun way and, and find the right location that, you know, we can support the overhead and do, and do the right pricing so that people can enjoy it day in and day out. Because that was really the idea behind that. I wanted people to, you know, find another location other than Costco to have an amazing chicken, you know, <laughs> you know. <laughs> To have, to, <laughs> you know, you know. Oh, yeah, that's. I mean, that's real shit. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The, the rotisserie chicken is great. It's like four bucks. Yeah. So yeah, it's hard to beat that. You know, <laughs> a, a conglomerate like that that's getting pricing so wonderful. But you know, mine is about flavor. You know, we brined our chickens for 16 hours. We hung them to dry the skin so we get a better skin. You know, we made every sauce in house. We made every dressing in house. And and that is me as a chef. You know, I'm always trying to put the flavor on the table, you know, yeah. and find the ways to do that. And, and really, you know, uh, there's all these, con- you know, there's high end dining and there's, there's fast casual dining, but I think there's, um, you know, what I've learned now over the last few years, there's, there's a kind of synergy be- be- behind both of them. And, you know, I know both sides and I, and I like to cook both ways. And, and, um, you know, this is for me a, kind of a legacy opportunity to have on my tool belt to say, you know, Santa Fe dining scene, you did it. You've been a chef. You've been an owner of a restaurant here. Um, but yeah, so, you know, the, a place like Roti is is definitely on my front mind that I want to put something really cool possibly out here uh, that could really support the community and, and do some amazing food for, for a larger portion of the, of the community. And when you are putting together dishes, is there like, is there a general formula that like goes into making a great dish? Is it based on the type of meat, the type of poultry, like what, like, how is that concocted for me? It seems like a science experiment. Yeah. Yeah. For me, it's really based on the culture and the region. Like, what am I trying to accomplish? You know, in my now little bit of history, I've been able to travel a lot and go to different places in the world and, and see, you know, culture and, and taste different spices and chilies and, and understand like that t- style of food. And as, you know, growing up now as a chef, I'm thinking to myself, you know, that's really what makes me excited about food is learning. I love to learn and I love to taste. And so for me, I start to center it around like what region, what culture, that's where I start with. You know, let's say, uh, for example, our lamb sausage on our menu here, you know, it was really about northern Africa. It was about, you know, Spain, Northern Africa, Moorish culture and, and kind of how those kind of connected and those flavors and and then, you know, making naan bread and, and, and understanding, you know, the right way to do it. And we made a sourdough naan. So it's kind of starts around the culture for me. And then it's around the ingredients. And then you're starting to think about 
certain ingredients and how those flavors are going to play with this and how, you know, more importantly, flavor echo after three bites. Does it still taste the same or is it going to taste hotter? Is it going to taste sweeter? Is it going to get less on you? You know, there's all these little things as a chef that I'm trying to think about from the first bite to the last bite for a guest. You know, how does that make you feel? I've never thought about that. There are... <laughs> Yeah, sometimes when you're eating, it's like the flavor kind of washes away. Yeah. About halfway through it. And you're like, you know what you're eating. Your brain recognizes it as this tastes good, but it's not like yeah, the, boom. The greatest boom, chefs boom, will work on boom. Last bite's probably better than your first bite. It's a it's a flavor echo. There's a way to understand it. There's also memories that I work off of, you know, flavor memories. I remember going to Bogota, Colombia and going to the market and trying these beautiful ruby beans with an arepa freshly made right in front of me. Now, I remember that like distinctly. I could smell it. I can understand it. I want to replicate that moment in some way. Does it have to be the same thing? No, but can it be some of those flavors and some of those ways of doing things? Yeah, that's that's kind of where I start to build, you know, dishes and um, because the best chefs will make, you know, you feel a time and a place when you're eating, a memory, a flavor memory. Oh my God, that reminds me of my grandma. Or, oh, I've had that before. Oh, that tastes just like the way I had it over or whatever. You know, those are those memories or, gosh, that made me feel like a kid again. You know, sometimes you taste something and you're like, wow, that made me feel like a child, but that's a cool <laughs> feeling. That's amazing, you know, and, and that's, you know, as I want to be better, those are the memories and the, and the experiences I want to, you know, give to my guests. I want them to be like, what the heck was that? Like, yeah. why did that make me excited? Like, I, I, it was spicy, but it wasn't too spicy. You know, we have another dish on our menu that I'm really proud of. It, it's this... Uh, we take bison and we take the short rib and we cook it down and we make these beautiful croquetas and they're just these fried little balls but inside is this this braised bison meat and it's served with this peanut and shiitake mushroom sauce and pickled plums and it's this kind of it's kind of my nod to chinese cooking and chinese flavors and and um it's just this flavor bomb it's this umami bite and and you know when people try it out here, I love when I hear, and they're like, I thought a croqueta was this, but no, it's this, you know? So I took that experience, and I kind of molded it into something that was unique to us and what, and what I love, you know? So that's, yeah, to say that's how I develop a dish. I really think about those, those uh, cultural ideas, flavors, and ingredients, and then we start to piece it together to make sense, and and then there's a lot of tasting and a lot of throwing that to the side. That didn't work or <laughs> that's a little too hot or a little too dry, you know. And then before you know it, you, you create a dish that is executed night after night by somebody other than you. And they're making it the same way. That's when a chef, I watched that, you know, this past weekend. We had Indian market and we were busy. And I was watching dishes coming out. I was thinking to myself, like, man, that's the coolest feeling, watching dishes coming out looking beautiful and going to the table, and people are excited. And, you know, so from that point, from conception to seeing it go out consistently, it's a super cool feeling. Yeah, because at the end of the day, that's got to be the goal, right? Is because you can't be everywhere at once. You, I mean, there is going to be a day where you're too sick to come into work. Sure. And so you got to have the people under you that are making the food, you know, getting it up to your standard as much as humanly possible. Um, what is, how do I put this? Like when you are training, when you're training employees that are going to, or chefs that are going to be working under you, replicating these dishes, are you, what are like the top attributes that you're really trying to instill in them aside from just skill and understanding how to, you know, use different cooking instruments and different mm -hmm. like, like boiling points and spices sure. and f like, don't make these flavors clash or whatever it is. Um, what are the main things you're trying to instill in them that you know is like, okay, yes, this is not only going to enhance their skill, but this creates longevity. Yeah. You know, the big, the big one is being organized. You have to be organized. You have to have your lists. You have to have your, your notes. You have to be organized. You have to have yourself positioned to win, you know? So, you know, I'm looking for somebody that's very organized. Um, somebody that can be vocal at times, you know, especially a sous chef, you're going to want somebody that can you know, be vocal for you when, when you're not around and, and to, you know, somebody that's detail oriented, that they're looking at the finer points of everything, you know, 
Um, I'm really crazy about it. You know, I make sure every towel is folded correctly. Every spatula is faced the same way. You know, that's the discipline and, and the organization that I look for in, in a chef. You know, the rest of it can be taught, you know, flavors and recipes and all those little things. Um, but having somebody that's organized and detail oriented is most important to me. You know, somebody that's going to be very precise and, and, and care. You know, um, and that's very easy to tell immediately. <laughs> You'll see if somebody really cares or they're just putting on a show for you or, yep. you know, um, it doesn't take me much longer than a couple of months for me to suss out anybody that's, uh, you know, giving me a, a show or, or, you know, also to see something that's really flourishing. And I'm like, wow, this person has the abilities and I'm going to give them everything I got and let's keep them pushing forward. Um, because again, I'm a hardworking chef as well. I'm in the kitchen, we're training, we're dialing in things. A concept like this that's so new, you know, you're working, you're, you're, you're working constantly on, on developing the kitchen and the operation and where things should lie and how your bucket should be stacked, you know, because everything's about convenience in a kitchen for me. Efficiency. Efficiency, you're, you're working to, it's a flow, it's a dance. You know, the prep work's done when service is on and you're then servicing and then you're, 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 you're now performing. You, it gets to a point where you have to even think about where things are, where to grab things. That's it's, right. it's, like a, it's like an expanded version of muscle memory. That's right. I'm like a boom, bing, bomb. You're moving. You're getting things. You're, you know, tickets are coming in. You know, you see things. And, and honestly, that's so amazing how fast that's gelled here at this. I've done a lot of kitchens and it's very... It takes time, at least 90 days for them to kind of get used to everybody. And granted, I didn't know one of these people. No, I didn't know anybody three months ago. I hired everybody new here. And um, the way it's kind of come together is just pretty cool to me. It's magical almost. I'm like, you know, because you know, I go into this with the expectation that, you know, we're going to have to learn. People are going to have to get to know me, um, how I like things. You know, that yeah. takes time. And, and we've kind of come up long way pretty quickly and then and, and i see that you know we're ready for the next level like adding the beef program and you know because if you add a beef program like this that's such a high-end product there's no screwing around there's yeah. no losing your steak yep. or overcooking something you're or, losing money you're losing and money. big money at yeah. that too because yeah it's not cheap to do this either and um but now i have a great person on the grill his name's everett good guy works his butt off a great he's learned a lot from the moment he started and we're doing over wood cooking that's a whole nother game too that's a whole nother science keeping your fire hot keeping your coals separate building your next set you know keeping that because it's not a gas burner it doesn't stay on high the whole night right you're working through it you're adding you know fuel to it throughout the night you're checking temperatures you're rising your grill so that it's you know your meats are at different levels so that they're cooking properly so why, okay, yeah, just small tangent. Why is it that outside of just like the surface level, you're, it's a different way of doing it, but like why does fire, fire anything taste so much better than just like on like a, you know, on like a gas burner mm -hmm. or something like that? Like what, what is it about it getting cooked by fire for that me, makes it better? It's temperature first and foremost for meat, right? Because you can get it at a really hot temperature, much hotter than a gas grill could ever get. And you really want that because then you can render down the fat properly. The other part is the smoke. You know, you're getting the smoke from when the fat hits the, the charcoal and the wood and the smoke's billowing over it. The third thing is the char, you know, that little crust that's built from, from, cause also too, you got to let things sit and, 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 and get to that place before you turn. So you're building char. So it's really about the smoke, the heat and the char for me, I think just pushes so much flavor into any sort of protein. Um, cause again, we do, uh, venison, uh, we do elk. Uh, nice. those are, you know, game meats that are a little different, but you know, the way we marinate them and the way we um, tenderize them, it allows them to cook on this really high heat and build this beautiful char. And they're just, you know, it's a different taste. You know, we cooked one separately from the wood grill and then we tasted it. Um, we did one on like a saute pan and we tasted it. It's like day and night. And it's just really that char, the flavor of the smoke and that high heat that you get to sear really fast on. I was going to say, like, so because you hear a lot of, like, a, like, like Traeger grills, like the really high-end yeah, models yeah. where you can, like, smoke something for hours. Yeah. Like, slow, like, slow burn these things. Uh, you're taking two different avenues to get to a good flavor, but what's the methodology between, like, no, this piece of meat needs to be at a high heat quick, well, quicker. Sure. And then this piece of meat needs to get slow cooked 
for like eight hours. Sure, like anything that's lean and and ha- has a lot of muscle that you're gonna have to break down over time, such as like a short rib, um, you know, things like that are gonna take anywhere from seven to six hours, depending on your size, because you're breaking down the fats, you're breaking down the muscle, so you're allowing it to become that, you know, pull apart, sucking a brisket. Right. You know, a brisket needs really, and that's a, you have to be an expert to cook a brisket, really, to do it right. You have to know how to rest it and how to wrap it and, and keep that temperature right where you want it, um, because it's, it's still breaking down the fats and the muscles without drying it out. You know, um, so really it's about, yeah, fats and muscles and, and, the, and, the, and the time, you know, like a sirloin steak or a, a strip loin steak, a filet mignon, you know, there's enough fat and it's lean enough that you could sear and cook it to a medium rare or rare and it still have good texture and it still is going to be chewable in a good way. Um, but yeah, you're looking at those two different things, you know, anything that has a lot of fat or a lot of muscle, you're going to have to break it down and it's going to have to take some time to be slow roasted and you know that's like with our bison short rib we sear it over the fire to get the flavor then we we add it to the pot so then braise it in the oven so that we build that flavor those layers you know that was something i learned as a young chef was building layers of flavor every section has a a layer because then you really taste that in those bites you get that first sweet or then that sour maybe that hot spice and then maybe that umami or that savory spice and, and that's kind of what a dish should have, you know, right. a, a proper dish should have a yeah. lot of different little notes that you're like, oh, wow, I taste these things. You know? So, so you're, make sense. you're speaking a lot on flavor for good reason. Can you ever justify a well done steak? <laughs> I'm not going to, no comment, man, because <laughs> we get a lot of them. <laughs> you know, it's funny because the guys in the back, they see that ticket come up, well done. And they're, like, <laughs> they're like, chef, well done, huh? And I'm like. Well, cause, they're great customers. Let's make them happy. Well, yeah, because it's one thing if that's what, if that just like anything in life, unless you're hurting other people, if you like it, whatever. Yeah. You know what I mean? If you like it, enjoy it, fine. But my whole thing, because the number one argument that I've heard for people that get their steak done, medium, medium well, or well done, the one argument that I hear as a common denominator is, well, I don't like a lot of blugs. I don't want to get sick off the food. It's like, okay. Do you really think any steakhouse worth their weight, whether it's a beautiful dining restaurant like this or a Outback, yeah, yeah. right? Just a chain steakhouse. Do you really think they're going to offer you anything that they think is going to make you no. sick? Do they want that lawsuit? No way. Come on, Not dude. Not at all. Not like, at all. You know what I mean? I just, I never, that's totally my own personal tangent. I just, I, I can't see the justification for a well done steak. Anyway. It's funny, man. You get a lot of, you get a lot, you know, like I tell the guys, hey, their customers, make sure that, and also too, you can make a, well, you can, you can make it okay because you you let it rest in the right way. You know, you're still going to get a bit of moisture, but you're apologizing to it as you're making it. I'm so sorry. sorry. I'm so sorry. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, man. It's, it's a funny thing, you know, um, But it's diners taste, man. You know, we're here for them. We're here for the customer. We're always here to make sure that they have the best experience because who am I to tell you how you should eat? No, yeah. (laughs) I want want to give you my flavors, but, you know, um, I want you to enjoy your experience most importantly. But, uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's a crazy experience to, you know, diners are funny and they're, you know, very particular. And, and like I always tell my guys, you know, we're in the hospitality industry. Right. We have to enjoy it, you right. know, and you have to loosen up your shoulders, make people feel comfortable. You know, yeah. they're in your house. Let them see what we're about. And, and that's kind of the service we're trying to go after. We're, we're refined and we're comfortable. You know, we want you to feel good, but we're not stuffy. You know, we're a modern restaurant. We, you know, we we play a little bit of more modern music in here when during service. Um, You know, we're working with some younger crews so we can train the next generation to be great as well. And, and, uh, you know, we're we're, we're proud of that. And I think that's really where we want to keep going towards. And, uh, you know, we're in this beautiful traditional environment, but I think we have an opportunity to give a modern experience as well. Right. And I I do want to close the loop on something we were talking about a little bit earlier. Um, The number one thing you want with the chefs you're training is someone that's organized, somebody that is uh, attention to detail, Mm -hmm. well, detail oriented, Mm -hmm. disciplined, walking in the door. Um, And you said that you can kind of snuff that out, whether or not it's it's, you know, on the positive or the negative end of that. Mm -hmm. When you do have to confront, all right, this isn't working out for this person, are there like mental checklists you have where it's like, okay, well, we're at this point, 
but no, this person can still be trained. This person can still be whatever. Mm -hmm. And then it just gets like, okay, I just don't think this is going to work out. Like, what are those like signs that you're looking for and how do you help remedy those? Well, you know, I give, you know, I go in a 30, 60, 90 day process, you know, 30 days. It's like a relationship. They're getting to know me. They're seeing what our environment's about. Depending on how the, the setup is, is if we're really organized and we've been around for a while, you know, then that 30 days might turn into 15 days because everything's set up for you. You know yeah. what's going on. Right. In this case, you know, I give, I've given everybody a chance here, 30 days, you know, to see what the environment is. We built this restaurant. We got set up. We've had some services. Now we're in the 60 day mode where I'm starting to, you know, we know each other more. <laughs> yeah. Here's the details I'm looking for. Here's the coaching I'm giving. Here's the training. Then it's evaluating, are they able to be uh, good students and learn it and then put it to practice? And then after that, you know, if somebody's still kind of uh, dragging a bit, you know, there's one more good conversation about it and and kind of understanding what their issue might be or what maybe we're doing wrong because, you know, we could be doing something wrong as well. And um, after that, if it's still not working, then that's where the conversation comes in and it's, you know, it's probably best for both of us, you know, in all honesty, if somebody's not happy or it's not clicking for them, um, you know, it's probably best for them to find that environment that they do click and they do do their best work. And, um, but I give everything a a fair chance, you know, I'm not a person that comes in, you know, interviewing and and trying to understand somebody sitting down and then actually working. It's a completely different thing. And what I do with my kitchen is I ask them to come and do a stage night or a couple nights just to work with us and see what we do and see how it works. And then at the end of the night, I I talk to them. Like a shadowing type thing. Yeah. Yeah. I say, you know, how do you feel about it? You know, what do you think? You know, let's be honest. Is this something you could be a part of five days a week and, you know, put in hard effort with me and, and, uh, you know, nine times out of 10, everybody's like, yes. And, um, but the repetitive of this, the, you know, doing it night overnight and, and being busy, you know, that's where the stress tests come in. And, and that's kind of where we're at. We, again, we just had Indian market. We were really busy the week before, really busy. Um, and we're kind of seeing the cream rise to the top and the ones that are doing really well. And, and, uh, again, knock on wood, we are (laughs) doing really well with, with the team that we've started with. And, um, it's now our job just to keep training them, keep them excited, keep motivating, um, keep marketing ourselves and, and keeping us busy so that they have services to keep going off of, um, so yeah, it, for me, like I said, you know, to wrap that is just a 30, 60, 90 day process. You know, I evaluate, you know, cause then I can give an honest opinion on somebody, you know, I'm not somebody that just hastily says, Oh, he didn't do it today. And that's, he's not going to be good ever. You know, I look at it as, okay, let's make sure he understands what he did wrong. Can he fix that? If he can't, then, then we have other conversations, but, uh, um, and everything I do, I try to be strategic. I'm not gonna, you know, I guess people have a, a a vision of a chef, you know, screaming and yelling all day and being crazy, but um, there's a time and place for it. But I, I try to work off of uh, being a little more calm and, and prepared yeah. and, and um, setting up systems, you know, setting up operations that they can be successful on, you know. And, and, you know, again, I think nine times out of ten, if you set up a great system and a great operation, they are ready to execute, you know? Yeah. And I also try to like, sorry. To, no, no, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I also try to like <clears throat> specialize positions, right? You have a grill guy. That's what his specialty is. I want him to be the best grill guy. I want my saute to be the best saute guy. And uh, some kitchens can get a little wild and having one guy doing a little prep and a little saute and a little of this. But my mission with a kitchen like this is to really have everybody specializing in a specific role so that we have the best on each role, you know. Well, that's the perfect, perfect way to do it. I mean, you don't, that's, and that's any, back to organization, that's any well-oiled, organized team. Yeah. Like, if you have an amazing PR person, you don't want them writing, you know, uh, writing speeches. And yeah. if you have a great speech person, you don't really want them taking care of the finances, probably not, yeah. right? Yeah. You have a great person in each role, and they can all work together. Yep. I mean, that in theory, it should work out quite well. Um, I do want to be respectful of your time. Uh, the last thing I want to ask you is, so obviously you're a, you're a chef working at a high level. You love what you're doing. What is, because... It's interesting. I've been, uh, I learned about a month or two ago about the psychology behind uh, a comfort movie 
and why people do that. Like mm -hmm. why people watch comfort movies or comfort TV shows. Like during the pandemic, a bunch of people just got into the office, right? Sure. It was like the number one stream show on Netflix and people rewatch it, watch for the first time just over and over and over. And the psychology behind it is you know how this story ends, you know how it progress or begins, progresses and ends. You're comfortable with the ending, you're happy with the ending, and you like going on that ride because at least that's something it gives you the false sense of control, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And it makes you comfortable that way. Mm -hmm. Whereas like life life Interesting. it's like life could be falling apart. But like for me, one of my comfort movies is the uh, is the first Spider Man with Tobey Maguire. Okay, okay. Right, so I saw that. I'm like, yeah, he's gonna, he's, you know what? He's gonna show up. He's not gonna be attractive. He's gonna get power. He's gonna <laughs> fight the Green Goblin. And he's gonna stun on Mary Jane and keep moving on and keep it trucking. So I love, but that's just also a great story. But it's a comfort movie to me, sure. right? But also a comfort movie to me is the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. So whatever, yeah. You know what I mean? Like, whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But my my point in that is it's a comfortable place to go, and I know I'm gonna be happy going on that journey. What is comfort food to you? Home do you, cooking. Do you have a comfort yeah, meal? Like, you know, or? Yeah, you know, it's funny because I thought about this just not too recently. It's something my mom would make. You know, it's something like spaghetti, you know, with meat sauce, you know, that my mom would make. I, or my mom's sweet rice. If I had that right now, completely comfortable. <laughs> it would remind me of them. It would, you know, it, so anything from like my family, my grandma Baca's oatmeal and chocolate cookies that she used to make for us. Um, the peaches from my grandpa's tree that he would pick for us and when they're ripe and wash it and allow us to eat it and, you know, or just the tortillas my, my grandma would make for us. So, you know, comfort food to me are those memories of, you know, family sitting around, Christmas dinners and ham that my auntie made, but it may be a little dry, but it, it was great. It reminded me of times when we were having fun with the family and sitting around. And, and uh, I guess as you get older and busier, you lose sight of those things sometimes, you know? And, and I do, um, I did, I had a great upbringing. The Aragon and the Baca family, they were big families and, and we had big celebrations. And, and so when I think about comfort food, I think about my family. I think about, you know, dishes, you know, my sister makes, you know, a barbecue ribs in her oven and, you know, and, and, and it just tastes good to me. And it reminds me of, of those times. So yeah, that's comfort to me. I think it's those flavor memories. It's those experiences and, and just being with family. And that's, that, that always makes me comfortable. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, listen, this has been absolutely phenomenal. Uh, you clearly are the are the right person to run in this place. And you're in. You're doing what you're supposed to be doing. I think. You, you know what I mean. It's very obvious, and uh, not a lot of people find that. No, unfortunately, no. you know what I mean. And I think that number of people that don't find it is increasing. Uh, unfortunately, whether that's just due to personal situations, financial situations, whatever it is. But it's always awesome highlighting the people that have found that. So congratulations thank to you, you for I, being I, able to find you. that and actually execute on it. Mm. You know what I mean? As a whole other piece of the equation, too. Um, I really appreciate you hosting me thank and having you. me here. Thank and you for being here, man. Yeah, I'll, of course. I'll have to have you here for some food next, right? Oh, I'd love to. Come on in, man. We're going to make some good food for you. <laughs> I, I want to show you some things. Yeah. I'd love to. Yeah. Um, before we get out of here, where can well, where, where is the restaurant located? And then how can people find you guys on social media? Cool. Yeah. So we're at 210 Don Gaspar. We're located at the Hotel St. Francis. Um, you can find us on Instagram, wolfandroadrunner.com, or, or sorry, wolfandroadrunner on Instagram, and then uh, our website is wolfandroadrunner.com. Open table, you can make a reservation, um, or just stop on in and say, it's Chef here, and I'll come on out. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, thank you I again very you, much. Thank this was an absolute pleasure. You, thank, you. Thank, you for thank you. Thank you, everyone, for listening and watching, and we will see you next time. Bye, everybody. Bye. <laughs>